Hello. Hello, good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever time of day it is for you. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this space, this resource. Our goal is to help you develop that habit of getting into Scripture every day. We know it could be tough and intimidating. So we show up and we'll talk about Scripture with you. We'll look at it together. My name is Rebecca Palmentier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit, and it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, we are finishing up the letter in 2 Timothy, and I'm, I'm coming late today, uh, Wednesdays, have an opportunity to serve in the community, and the only time available was in the morning. So I'm coming to you late today. It's possible we might finish 2 Timothy today. It's going to be really close. Um, so we're going to dig in. As we're wrapping up, I want us to actually get a little bit bigger of a picture of Paul of his life and ministry and kind of this journey toward the end of his life because that's that's what Paul is is viewing and considering as he's writing these last words to Timothy. So, hi Melanie, good morning. Yeah, no Wednesdays I'm trying to to actually do it live Tuesday night. Uh, if I'm able. Otherwise, I'll have to jump on a little bit later on Wednesday, but I don't want us to skip it. So my hope, honestly, is to to load it Tuesday so that it's there for people Wednesday morning. But here we are. Let's do it. Let's pray. And uh, if friends are able to join in, that's great, but I know, I know it's a different time of day. So let's go ahead and let's do it. Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. Lord, we set our attention on you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to receive your word and to just to just marvel, maybe feel a bit of the weight, but also feel the trust and the confidence that Paul placed in you and that we can place in you. And be with us, Lord. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, here we go. All right. We are wrapping this up. We've been looking at First and Second Timothy. Their letters, we believe, are written by Paul to Timothy. Let's pick up chapter 4, verse 16. It says this. At my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Technically, there are a few more verses after this to wrap out the letter, and we're going to look at those. He's going to mention more people by name and kind of close out the letter because it's a letter. Uh, but this, this here, these verses that Paul is ending with. I'm, I feel like his whole letter has been like this crescendo that gets to this message. What is Paul in his final words going to pass on to Timothy beyond, um, you know, here are things that you need to be thinking about and watching for, guard against false teaching. You know, those, those are like practical things that he's put in this letter leading up to it. But I really feel like Paul's heart Paul's heart, as he's looking back on his life, this is the message that he's wanting to part, impart to Timothy. All right? So he says here in verse 16, he says, at my first defense. Um, it's important for us to know what defense, what event he's talking of. Paul has uh, been put in jail and prisons like multiple times and and even Roman imprisonment he was in Roman imprisonment twice right so he's about to say that no one stood with him and the question is wait a minute what defense are you talking about I brought in some information to just kind of let you know he's not talking about his first Roman imprisonment there are some that might think that but he's not and and the logic on that the reasoning is pointing to Philippians 2, 19 through 23. Philippians was written, and Paul, um, he wrote Philippians toward the end of his Roman imprisonment. And he wrote in that letter that he was going to be sending Timothy to Philippi, right? Timothy was with him. That's one of those ways that we know. Timothy was with Paul and connecting with Paul 
after he had already been in Roman imprisonment. So when, when Paul is describing at my first defense, no one was with me, no, no one stood with me, we know that that's not pointing to the previous time that he was in prison in Rome. Um, those two moments, by the way, his first imprisonment and his second Roman imprisonment, they're distinctly different. We're going to get into that in a little bit. So Timothy would have known about the events happening in his first Roman imprisonment. So it's, it's obvious to us that he's not talking about them. So most likely, Paul is speaking here about the first legal proceeding of his current Roman imprisonment. Prisoners would be taken before various leaders, um, even leading up to the emperor, which we know he, he spoke before the emperor even with his first Roman imprisonment. Um, he would be brought before, and basically they'd have to present a case, right? They have to have accusers making a case. They have to um, give the person a chance to defend themselves and more than them speaking on their own behalf. Typically, there would be people that would stand up for them to plead their case, to plead their innocence, to um, to corroborate if there was you know specific things charged against them. Paul is saying this time, in the second Roman imprisonment, no one stood by him, no one stood up for him. All right, he says, "No one stood by me, but everyone deserted me." Um, Faith Life Study Bible says, "No one." Sadly, no one came forward or was available to make a formal defense on Paul's behalf this time. Paul also could mean that none of his co-workers came to provide him moral support. It just gives me pause to think about, this is the Apostle Paul. This, this is Paul who has done so much and people have experienced his teaching, his leadership, his ministry. Um, they've witnessed miraculous things that God has manifested in and through Paul and his ministry, right? And yet now we're seeing in this latter part of his life, something is different. We're going to talk about that more in a second. Here we go. Ways that this is different distinctly different from the first time. There's much less support and harsher conditions. There, why, why would there be such a shift? Well, I'll tell you politically, a huge thing happened in this time. Uh, Nero became emperor. And according to some of these antiquitous historical documents that we have, including uh, writings of Josephus, is, is one like antiquitous ancient historian. Um, he points to a fire that had happened in Rome in one of the districts. And um, this fire caused a huge uproar among the people. And there was already starting to be tensions between uh, Jews and those in Rome. Well, this fire just sets it off. Uh, Nero, I think, wanting to um, find someone else to blame, he actually blames the Jews for this fire that happened in Rome. And so people are very much up in arms. And it is, it's becoming more and more clear that the government is not pro-Jew. And thus, because Christians in the beginning, the way was really, you know, kind of bundled in with Jews. So the government has turned to be against Jews and against Christians, against those of the way. When the emperor is adamantly against them, how, how likely do you think it's going to be that people are going to go stand in his court and speak a defense against Paul? Paul had been arrested before in Rome and, and he had been, well, it was more like a house arrest that first time. He was um, for a couple years under um, ownership or control, I, I don't know which is the right to say, but he was put in house arrest by them. Uh, but this second time, they don't allow him to go to house arrest anymore. They actually put him in prison, in prison. Uh, but it's been a, a, like years of this animosity growing. And so this time, Paul says, no one stood by me. Everyone deserted me. 
The Faith Life Study Bible also makes this observation that is so good. It says, ironically, the apostle's trial in Rome allowed him to fulfill his call to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And I want us, since this letter is written at the end of Paul's life, I think it's so beautiful for us in light of what he's saying right now to take maybe a, a bigger view for a moment. It is, just as Faith Life Study Bible says, it, it is these uh, trials in Rome and this journey even to Rome that allows Paul to fulfill what God had called on his life and said. And so I'm going to point to you two scriptures really quick. The first one I've actually pointed to before. This was a moment when Paul was first... Um, he had first experienced the risen Jesus. On the road to Damascus, he turns blind. God speaks to a man of faith named Ananias and says, uh, you need to go and you need to share the gospel and you need to lay your hands and pray over this guy, Paul, right? And so I shared this scripture. Uh, this is in Acts 9. Let me move slide. Uh-oh. There it is. <laughs> Acts 9, 15 and 16 says this. The Lord said to him, Ananias, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show you how much he must suffer for my name. Even from the beginning when Paul was called, first of all, I find it amazing that this call immediately, what God spoke is that he was going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Because at that time... <laughs> Um, the gospel is predominantly being shared to Jews in things like synagogues. Um, it, it was still this wonder, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to end up going to Gentiles too. That was still kind of new, all right? So um, that word was spoken over him, which is beautiful. But he even said that he's going to take it to kings. He's going to take the Lord's gospel to kings, Right? and to Israelites. And then it mentions suffering, which there's no way we can look at Paul's life and not recognize suffering connected. This is a moment that led to Paul being sent to Rome. And so I want to point it out. In Acts 23, verses 10 and 11 says this, when the dispute, this public dispute about Paul became violent, the commander, the Roman commander, feared that Paul might be torn apart by them and he ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them, and bring him into the barracks. And the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Have courage, for as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. There are some interesting moments along the way in Paul's life um, where circumstances from the, out, from the person outward looking in would be like, oh, he's going through like some yucky and awful stuff. And yet we see even, for example, this word that the Lord spoke to Paul when he was first taken into custody for his own protection because the Jewish community was about to have a riot and, and murder him in the public streets, right? So he's taken into jail for his own protection. And the Lord tells him, you're going to bring your testimony all the way to Rome. Right now he's not in Rome. He's in Jerusalem. The Lord says, you're going to take the message all the way to Rome. So far, Paul has done missionary journeys, right? We, we talk about these three missionary journeys that Paul did. And um, they've not gone as far as Rome. They, they started small in the first one, small in comparison, then got a little bigger, then it got a little bigger. But we know that Paul gets to go to Rome. So I, I bring this up again, this observation that Paul gets to take the message all the way to Rome because of this persecution. And if I could, can I make one more scripture connection for us? This is the scripture where Jesus, in Acts 1-8, Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. He's been with his disciples for 40 days, continuing to preach and teach, resurrected, right? And he's showing himself to people in the public. Um, 
amazing things are happening in that period. And Jesus has been preparing them because he's going to ascend. And the, he says the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to be a comforter. He's going to guide you, right? And Jesus says this. Check this out. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The cool thing about Jesus saying those phrases in those regions is it, it does that. It goes Jerusalem and then all Judea and Samaria, which is the, the larger region, that larger area north and south of Jerusalem. Okay. And then to the ends of the earth. Think about that picture, that call, and I want to show you this. Man, my slide does not want to work today. Come on. There it is. Okay, so first, Paul, when he was ministering, he started in Jerusalem, right? He ministered to the first, first to the Jews in Jerusalem. Then he started reaching the other areas, Judea and Samaria. Samaria. Which, by the way, do you remember the Samaritans and how much the Jews despised them and hated them? They considered them dirty dogs, right? Jesus' words about sharing the gospel, I love that he specifically said Samaria. Samaria, this region that your people group has like looked down on and stomped on, the gospel is going to be brought there too, right? Again, that's all, that's all before the Holy Spirit. Again, that's Jesus saying it from the very beginning, right? Anyway, Paul, when he started doing the missionary journeys, he ventured out from Jerusalem and he started going to other regions and other spaces in Judea and Samaria, right? And it just kind of expounded. And then he says to the ends of the earth, for us, for the early church, for the world, the ends of the earth is Rome. Rome is the world force, the world dominating force. Rome has outposts everywhere, right? And Rome has like claimed, they've claimed all of this region. It's Rome, it's Rome, it's Rome, right? And so the gospel now, it's, it's been in Jerusalem. It's been in Judea and Samaria. But it's actually through Paul being in this imprisonment, right? Be being challenged and persecuted by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem that he ends up being able to even take the gospel to Rome. And from there, he would spend years in house arrest writing letters, sharing the gospel to churches in other regions. Paul from there would also be sending other missionaries that would go out. Paul's position in Rome allowed the gospel to spread even further, taken by the Roman Empire to the ends of the earth. Isn't that cool? I put here specifically some of the, um, in this last section of Paul's uh, life, where specifically regarding this imprisonment and this trial, you can look in Acts 24 and 25. I'm not going to spend too much time in here on it. But you can see that the Sanhedrin is the Jewish high court. And they're the ones that are having a really, really difficult time uh, with the early church, just like they did Jesus. They were the ones that advocated for Jesus to be crucified, right? Because they thought uh, Jesus was blasphemous against God and his law. They didn't, they didn't see the connection of Jesus as the Messiah right? Jewish Sanhedrin can only do so much. So they end up bringing their complaint to Governor Felix. The governors in this region, I know we're talking like kind of historical stuff, but I think it's cool. I hope you'll go on this little rabbit hole with me. We can see in Acts 24 and 25, you're going to see two governors mentioned, Governor Felix and Governor Festus. Governor Felix was first when Paul was, was taken to him, he's a Roman representative, a Roman governor over the region. All right? Felix ends up having him kind of imprisoned there. 
with him for two years. And then when he gets taken out of his position, Festivus, the governor, comes in and takes his place as the next governor. All right. So you see that in Acts 24. And then the beginning of 25, you start to see Festivus. And Festivus comes in and he re- he hears that there's this guy that's been left in the jail for the last two years. He's wanting to come and kind of clean house a little bit. So we see Governor Festus come in and he brings Paul up. And then we see this guy named Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II. And they call him a king. And you and I, when we think of kings and governors, right? Like, I don't know about you, but my brain is king is up here. Governor is like local and regional. This was actually entirely different. The king was allowed to be in that position because he was Jewish. But he, this guy, guys, King Agrippa II was Jewish in like name or bloodline only. His culture, his heart actually had nothing to do with Jewish values at all at all at all and um he leaned way more into greek and roman way way more greek actually (laughs) greek ways of life but rome allowed him to be in this position all right so the governor felix governor festus and king agrippa ii those represent leaders of those regions judah and samaria and paul would be brought to them And then when he's brought to them, he gets to speak the gospel. He tells them the gospel. And he talks about his his life and ministry leading up until that point and how God revealed himself, right? You see that in Acts 24 and 25. Um, Herod Agrippa II, by the way, you'll also see Bernice is a name that's mentioned with him. That's his sister. And while the the Bible doesn't actually spell it out, um, we have other documents, antiquitous historical documents, that lead us to believe that there was like an incestuous relationship between those two. So they were were not very keen on the gospel. (laughs) But you can read those places um, where Paul gets to share the message with these leaders, along with speaking in those regions. And again, how is he getting to speak to kings? Because he was persecuted. Because he was persecuted by the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders. That's how this all came about, right? If they hadn't persecuted him, then that, not centurion, but like the the Roman officer would not have been like, oh, we need to take him in and make sure they don't kill him in the public square. And then they never would have had this case against him. Do you know what I mean? So in this example of Paul, what we're seeing here is that persecution and disappointment seemingly from like the outsider's view, that is actually moving Paul to these positions where he is sharing the gospel with kings, with Gentiles in all sorts of regions. And he's even going to get to share the gospel to the emperor of Rome. And that's what I write here, to the ends of the earth. He gets to go to Emperor Nero and he gets to speak in his court. And so not only does the emperor hear the gospel, but his advisors and other people that are in the court in Rome do as well. I think I continue to just do on that because I think of how often, how often, I don't know if it's human nature, but we see suffering And we immediately pull back and think, what did I do wrong? What do I need to fix to get out of it? And this just challenges my heart that God will purposefully allow suffering. Because even in suffering, there's an opportunity to bring him glory. Even in suffering, there's an opportunity. There are open doors to speak to people that you might never have reached if you hadn't been walking through that suffering gives me pause. I hope so. I hope it gives you pause too. All right. 
He says, at my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. And I wrote the apostles' trial in Rome allowed him to fulfill his call to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And I will add to the regions of Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Paul immediately says after this, after he says, no one stood by me, everyone deserted me, he says, may it not be counted against them. May it not be counted against them. David Gusick observes that Paul was not bitter, that all forsook him. This is powerful evidence of a great work of grace and spiritual maturity. Yeah. Oh, I love that flow. Hope always. Yeah. Remember that this is Timothy that is receiving this letter from a guy that was like a father to him. Would you be upset if you heard that someone you loved was neglected? Uh, That people that you expected to care for them or defend them did not? Yeah, it could be really easy to take up an offense. And so I, I appreciate that Paul says, let this not be held against them. I think we're gonna stop there today. We're going we're gonna to split this up. I want to stop there. I want us to sit and consider this awareness of suffering that it was absolutely through suffering that Paul was able to bring the gospel. Ooh, can I also point out, not just for Paul, but for the church as a whole, it was persecution that caused the gospel to spread. Yes. It was persecution because there were moments where Christians, fearing for their lives and their families' lives, would uproot themselves and move to another region. Or some regions actually made declarations that the Jews had to leave, right? So we saw Paul experience one of those moments, also Priscilla and Achilla, who we'll talk about more tomorrow. We see these moments, and even with Rome, even in this moment where I mentioned this fire, and then there ends up being this crazy persecution against Jews and Christians in that period, that causes Christians and their families to get up and go somewhere else. And the gospel reaches further. Yeah beauty for ashes. He can take something that the enemy intended to harm and turn it for his good. Mm. Let's think on that. Oh Lord, we love you. We thank you for this reminder about difficult seasons and difficult spaces and, and even persecution that Those are not spaces where you are absent. And those are not spaces where we have to run and hide. Those are not spaces where we pull away. But that it's in those difficult spaces that you are opening up different doors than expected. And you invite us to share your good news to those that are around us, to those that can hear it. That we share your good news. We continue to bring you glory. Because our hope is not based on our circumstance. Our hope is based in you alone. Help us, Lord. Help us be your witness, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow back at our normal time of uh, 8.30 Eastern. And we're going to finish up this letter. We're going to be in the last part of 2 Timothy. I hope you'll join us. Take care.